is Jason Jagger, please. Um, Jason is a New York based pianist, composer, and educator. He released four albums as a leader or co leader. Uh, his album United uh, was named one of the uh, 2017 Best in Downbeat magazine. He has performed in the Blue Note in New York, uh, Telonius in Buenos Aires, and at the Panama Jazz Festival. Uh, Jason has shared the stage with artists such as Luciana Sosa, Sean Jong, Aina Inerto, George Garzon, Jason Palmer, and many, many others. He also faculty at Berkeley, and is one of our first students being faculty at Berkeley, and it's uh, been really, really amazing to have you this year. And is an honor graduate, uh, graduate of the Tuff University New England Conservatory double degree program where he studied international relations and jazz performances. And um, in his uh, advisor is uh, Bruno Robert. Bruno, thank you for being here. Please uh, welcome Bruno. <laughs> and in his committee is Nando Michelin. Thank you, Nando, where are you? Thank you, please uh, welcome Nando. Yes. I would also like to acknowledge our artistic director, Danilo Perez. Please welcome Danilo here. <laughs> Song of Resistance. Thank you, Marco. Thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, the project is entitled New Songs of Resistance, and um, it stems from a love and fascination with the Nueva Cancion, or New Song Movement, from Latin America. Uh, I first became enamored with some of this music when I was living abroad in Buenos Aires, Argentina and heard the music of uh, Mercedes Sosa and Leon Gieco. Um, and I'll get into the, uh, the background of that movement uh, in a little bit. Um, the goals of uh, my project were to explore a socially and politically engaged music, um, to study artists associated with the Nueva Cancion tradition, to learn some of their repertoire, the rhythms, the forms, and so on. Uh, I then wanted to arrange and reimagine certain pieces for a chamber jazz ensemble, uh, including a, an instrumentation of flugelhorn, cello, and clarinet with rhythm section and voice. Uh, and then ultimately compose some new repertoire inspired by that music that would speak to uh, my feelings and reactions to the contemporary situation that we're all uh, ex living through today. Um, so the elements and process that I went through involved learning about the historical context in which this music arose, studying various repertoires associated with these artists, um, and also studying some folkloric styles and rhythms such as cueca from Chile, samba, chacarera, carnavalito from Argentina, the other, the samba with an S from Brazil, and um, merengue venezolano from Venezuela. So why Latin America? Um, you can see uh, that's me a few years ago musing the mysteries of the piano. And uh, about 20 years after that, I, I spent a semester studying abroad in Buenos Aires where I first heard a lot of this music and, and took some lessons with um, folkloric musicians. Um, there I am in Argentina on the right uh, with a charango, uh, an Andean uh, instrument native to the north of, Bra of Argentina. and some of the other Andean countries. And below that, uh, pictured in Cordoba, Argentina, with a photo of uh, the Roy Haynes Trio next to us, featuring our very own Danilo Perez and John Patitucci. Um, so it was, it was quite something to go that far away and, and find those guys there, at least in photographic form. Um, so some background on Nueva Cancion, uh, the movement, uh, started in the 1950s and the 60s in South America, principally in the Southern Cone, um, Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, uh, associated with artists like Violeta Parra, Victor Jara, Inti Elimani, Suni Paz, and so forth. Initially, it was a movement that brought indigenous folk music styles uh, and instruments into the mainstream music, um, which even when the lyrics were not overtly political, this uh, uh, Rosenthal and Flax, one of the uh, their book, Playing for Change, um, argues that this was actually a resistant act by bringing into uh, the mainstream these folk styles um, because they were in a 
you know, a popular music landscape that was really dominated by the U.S. and music imported from abroad, and this was a way to assert indigenous traditions and marginalized um, cultures. Um, a key date in, in my research uh, is September 11, 1973. This was the day when uh, an American-backed coup occurred in Chile, bringing the brutal dictator Augusto Pinochet to power. Um, in the process of that coup, uh, the democratically elected Salvador Allende was killed, as was Victor Jara, who is one of the uh, great artists and symbols of the Nueva Cancion movement. Um, and one of, the, one of the musicians whose songs I worked on for this project. There were related uh, sort of offshoots or parallel um, music movements opposing right-wing uh, dictatorships all over Latin America, which were spreading like a virus in the, in the 60s and 70s especially, um, not only Chile and Argentina, but also in Brazil and Cuba and elsewhere. Um, and then in addition to Victor Jara, the other artists whose songs I studied and, and recorded were uh, Violeta Parra, uh, Leon Gieco. Um, Leon Gieco is from Argentina. Victor Jara and Violeta Parra are both from Chile. And then also Chico Buarque from Brazil. And, uh, and now some music. Um, so the first piece that I want to share with you, um, this is a, a piece called Aquí Me Quedo by Victor Jara. It was uh, a setting of a poem by Pablo Neruda, and um, essentially the poem talks about a desire to maintain unity among his people and his, uh, his country, and um, there's even uh, some humor in the lyrics. Uh, for example, um, uh, the rich were always foreigners, may they go to Miami with their aunts. Um, and uh, so Victor Jara was a really, he was a prominent theater director before he took off as a singer-songwriter. He was a political activist associated with Salvador Allende. And um, I'm going to play just a clip of this piece um, and then uh, the original version and then I'll play my uh, rearrangement. <laughs> Siete cuchillos de sangrada, quiero la luz de Chile en arbolada sobre la nueva casa construida. Yo no quiero la patria dividida, ni por siete cuchillos de sangrada. And um, in my interpretation, uh, this clip uh, is of the, uh, the, the head out, the recapitulation of the theme. And um, the opening guitar melody that you heard, I decided to put in the bass and the cello. And I used that motif to create a modulation from the original key that we started in, in E flat up to F. And then when we see the melody come back at letter E, it might be a little small for you out there, but um, there's an ascending bass line beneath, and it sort of has this uh, somewhat uplifting feeling, uh, which is what I got from the music. And um, the uh, one thing that uh, I was kind of experimenting with on the musical side is in the, the interlude um, that you see at letter D there, I decided to orchestrate it so that the voice, uh, who's been the pro protagonist of the song, is now in the ensemble and playing a role sort of of a horn with uh, the clarinet voiced on top, and then the voice, and uh, the flugelhorn below, and then the cello playing the, the bass melody. And uh, the song also ends uh, in the original version with a really beautiful um, minor uh, one to five, and then back to one major, sort of like a uh, in the style of Bach, a, a Picardy third. And it sounds very hopeful and optimistic. Um, but given the tragic nature of what actually happened shortly after Victor Jara uh, released this song, this is a song from 1973, and he was killed uh, in September of 73, um, I wanted to uh, end with a sound that was a little darker and menacing and uh, mysterious. So um, 
the, you'll hear now uh, the pers these fabulous musicians playing with me, um, and Irini Tornasaki on the vocal, and this is uh, my a clip of my arrangement of Aki Me Quedo. <laughs> So the next uh, uh, piece I want to share with you is uh, Gracias a la Vida. It's become uh, Violeta Parra's uh, best love song. Violeta Parra, I like to think of sort of as something like the godmother of Nueva Canción. She was one of the first um, artists to go into the rural communities in Chile and document their music, uh, interview musicians, ask to learn their songs. There's a wonderful movie called Violeta Goes to Heaven that... Um, uh, really uh, tells the story of her life, which in many ways was quite tragic. Um, she established her own peña. Peña was sort of a meeting ground and a place to uh, share um, uh, folkloric music, dances, uh, and also was associated in some cases with political activity. Um, Gracias a la Vida was one of her final pieces before she tragically took her own life in 1967. Um, and a couple, I'll play a little bit of the original composition. Um, a couple uh, noteworthy uh, things is that the original is uh, indebted to the cueca uh, rhythm and form. Cueca later became the national dance of Chile. Uh, and one thing that I observed that was really interesting is her, the way she phrased over the rhythm uh, was, it had sort of a floating quality and was to me somewhat reminiscent of old country blues singers in that she would sometimes take a little bit longer on a phrase before going to the next phrase or going to the next chord. There would be uneven um, phrase lengths and it had this very organic uh, improvisatory uh, quality to it. Um, I also thought this was a really fitting quote of hers that for me resonated and also I think resonates a lot with the mission and uh, values at the Berkeley Global Jazz Institute uh, as far as creativity and music is concerned. Um, she said, write however you want use rhythms as they come to you, try out different instruments on the piano, destroy meter, free yourself, shout instead of sing, blow into the guitar and strum the horn, song is a bird without flight plan that will never fly in a straight line. It hates mathematics and loves whirlwinds. So uh, this is her piece, uh, an excerpt of her piece, Gracias a la Vida, the original. Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto, me dio dos lucetros que cuando los abro perfecto distingo lo negro del blanco y en el alto cielo su fondo brillado. Okay, 
Okay, so um, in my uh, version of this piece, and I've, I've put some of the lyrics up, there are a lot of lyrics, and I had to kind of choose the stanzas I wanted to include, and I chose the ones that resonated most with me, and if you read these lyrics, you'll notice that they're not overtly political in the way that Victor Jara's song was. Um, Violeta Parra did write some pieces that were more politically oriented, but um, to me, this is such a beautiful song and uh, an iconic piece, and one that, even if it's not overtly political, the, the values it states um, about uh, gratitude for life and love and, and the people in one's uh, orbit and community, I think, in a way, is really opposed to what, what was happening in Chile in the late 60s, um, and so was resistant in that sense. Um, some of the elements I used, uh, given that floating phrasing that I heard her singing with, I experimented with playing the song in 5-4 mostly. So um, I felt like the melody, it turned out to really glide nicely on top of a 5-4 rhythm. Um, I reharmonized the piece uh, quite a bit. Um, and there are two tempos, and in the faster version, I wanted, basically the faster tempo gives this sort of lift and optimism that the original doesn't necessarily share, but I, I felt so inspired by the message of these lyrics that I wanted to uh, express that. And um, in the faster tempo, I used a rhythm that I came into, that I learned this year in the global called Merengue Venezolano. Um, this is a, there's an example from drummer Mark Walker's uh, fantastic book of some notations of that. And I'll share briefly uh, what that uh, rhythm could sound like. Um, it's basically a quick 5-8. And it's similar to, uh, to my ear anyway, it's similar to the cueca rhythm, or probably more precisely the Venezuelan joropo, which are 6-8. This is a 5-8, and uh, some even call it a drunk 6, because it's as though the end of it's cut off. Um, if I were to play some of the, uh, the opening chords of Gracias a la Vida, um, at least in, in the key that we recorded it in, um, as more like a cueca feel, it might be something like this. And then if I did it uh, with the merengue venezolano, it could sound more like this. And uh, I displaced the, the bass, line, bass motion in my recording, which you'll hear, uh, but that's essentially the difference. It's got sort of this urgency and forward motion because uh, instead of being in 6-8, we're in 5. Um, so now I'll play for you uh, an excerpt from uh, my recording.
As I mentioned at the outset, um, a goal of this project was to compose my own music, uh, new songs of resistance, canciones nuevas, and um, uh, one of the pieces, uh, one of the three new compositions that I wrote is entitled The Facts, and I want to share a little bit about that with you. Um, it was inspired by uh, the denigration of facts in our society and public discourse. I've heard people call our current age the post-truth era which is deeply disturbing to me. Um, and it actually, the composition started with the words. The words came to me while I was walking actually through Greenwich Village. And this was something different for me. I haven't, when I've written lyrics, um, it's been slowly and painfully. And this was a rare instance when uh, the words came first, kind of in a flash. Um, uh, the the so-called uh, post-truth era to me um, conjured up the idea of 12-tone music uh, in the sense that in uh, a post-tonal environment, all 12 pitches are of equal weight. You don't have a home bass or a tonic pitch. You have all 12 pitches um, vying for uh, primacy or, or maybe equality. Um, in any sense, I felt like uh, I, I could best express this through that sort of technique. And I generated the first part of the tone row using the pitches from gr the opening pitches from the melody of Gracias a la Vida, the piece we just heard. So in this particular instance, I used, rather than use one of the folkloric rhythms or styles, I actually took pitch material from one of the songs that I had studied and arranged. In other cases, I used um, you know, uh, the folkloric styles. Um, but I'll just uh, play through a little bit of this to give you a sense of what the, the building blocks of the composition were. So the, the opening of Gracias a la Vida, as you heard, was uh, So I took the first six unique pitches from that melody. And then used that as the starting point. And uh, the prime row, the top row of pitches, uh, is this. And the way that I selected, so the first six notes come from Gracias a la Vida, the other six were just according to my ear and what I heard and what sounded uh, good to me, um, just so long as I used all 12 pitches in the tempered scale. Um, and then I manipulated the row uh, backwards, inverted, backwards and inverted, uh, according as you see on the slide, and used all of those in the composition. Um, and also uh, for the uh, melody, I. Um, took excerpts or bits and pieces of the row uh, or inverted row to um, create uh, the melodic fragments. The full row, when stated in rhythm, sounds like this. And then the row is also expressed harmonically through four triads. And uh, the, the clip I'm going to play now is going to feature, um, it's going to start with a, the end of a brief piano solo over those triads at the bottom there. And then, uh, and then the, the, the main melody with the lyrics will come in.
Thank you. Um, I have to wrap it up. Uh, these are some of the sources that I uh, consulted, and I r really learned a lot about these artists and the context in which they uh, create, created uh, their incredible music and um, was very inspired by a lot of that. Um, going forward, um, I'd like to uh, do some more composing for this project and release it as an album. Uh, one of the uh, pieces that I'm interested in working with is Victor Jara's last poem which uh, he wrote as a uh, prisoner in the Estadio Chile. Um, this poem was smuggled out and it's really quite grim and powerful. Um, and there have been some, from what I can gather, some musical adaptations, but um, I would uh, be interested in, in trying to set that poem to music. Um, I may uh, try to find a way uh, to support um, uh, an immigrant rights group um, uh, the way I see this tying into immigration is that a lot of the U.S. involvement in bringing some of these right-wing dictatorships to power um, uh, in South America and then also in Central America is also, I think, uh, we're seeing some of the, the blowback from that when you have refugees today coming from Central America in droves because of the violence plaguing their own countries. And um, it's something I want to look into uh, when, it, when I am able to finish this album completely. Um, organizations like Raices and so forth. Um, I'd love to present this music in, in tandem with the presentation um, and may uh, reach out to Latin American studies departments, schools, colleges and universities for presentation concert performances. Um, and finally, huge, huge thank you and gratitude to a lot of people, in particular to uh, my mentor and teacher, BGJI Artistic Director Danilo Perez, uh, to Managing Director Marco Pignataro, um, my co-producer and advisor Bruno Raberg and uh, committee member Nando Michelin, um, all the amazing musicians on the recording, Fernando Huergo, Mark Walker, well you can see all the names, Irini Tornasaki, Farai Malik, Mirela Costa, Milena Casalo, Cosimo Boni, Matthew Stubbs, Parker Owsley, Genyo Shimura, who was my assistant, Mark Wessel did a great job recording, all my teachers, my family, um, and uh, my family uh, includes this, this guy here, Thelonious Monk, the cat. And um, uh, I think I'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much for yeah. bearing with me. Thank you, Thank you Jim. Yeah. OK. I've, g I've just been informed we have seven minutes for comments, so I pass the microphone to Uh, Jason, thank you so much. That was 
a really outstanding presentation in, in every sense of the word. Um, it was an incredible pleasure to work with you this semester and see um, everything from the very beginning, from the very start, the embryos that you bring in for the compositions and uh, see it, you know, and be able to be in the studio with you and, and hear it recorded. Um, it's just outstanding, in, you know, in the research is outstanding and, and the way you were able to 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 um, bring in this <coughs> the musical inspirations and sources into into your own music and to truly create something original. Um, and also, I, it was great the way you you contacted all the people in the Berkeley community for as resources, Nando and Fernando and Mark and everybody. Um, you know, so congratulations! It's amazing. I hope I can come to to one of your concerts and and presentations. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Bruno. Hey, Jason! Amazing work, man. When when you came with the uh, to me with the with the charts and you told me that you wanted me to you know uh, give you some feedback, I I thought to myself, man, this is hard because the nature of this music is is mostly the lyrics. Is the is the the message, right. and and the subtlety of how they transmit the message when they when the uh, military government was breathing over their shoulder, you know, like trying to speak in metaphors and and transmit the ideas, like you said, on Gracias a la Vida, it's, it's not a political lyric, but mm -hmm. you know, it just goes against all the military government stand uh, stood for. So I thought to myself, you know, it's just a hard task to not to get the music in the way of the message, mm -hmm. to blend that music with the message. And I'm totally at all on how much you you manage to do that. You know, like get the, the message across from the lyrics, get some really cool music behind it without overpowering the, the message. So congratulations. And I second everything that Bruno said. Thank you. Funny, Jay, I was just got back from Argentina yeah. last yesterday. And I spent two weeks playing and with the people and I really learned a lot going to Panama, going to the DR, seeing this, hanging out in Argentina and you know, what the people go through and their, you know, strife to get the message across. So just in short, I agree with everything you say. Great concept, great project. Thank you. Jason, um, first of all, I, I'd like to congratulate you on, on uh, being such an active member of this community. And, you know, I, I imagine being faculty and going back to be a student must have been uh, challenging, but you really were always the first arriving, the <laughs> last one to leave. So <laughs> I, I really want to congratulate you on, on this year and everything you have done and Thanks. being such an example for for I think a lot of the students and for all of us really. Uh, um, I also wanted to uh, congratulate you on, on this really beautiful and, and investigation you did on the music. And I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about why you are orchestrated for this particular sure. uh, group and you know what is your idea behind that? Yeah, um, that was both for what I heard in the music and also sort of for a challenge for myself. This was an instrumentation that I had not written for before, and um, I had, you know, a representation from brass, the flugelhorn, from strings, the cello, and reeds, the clarinet. And I, I, in my head, anyway, I, I liked the idea or the sound of these very kind of warm uh, instruments with unique overlapping ranges and sonorities, and I thought it would be cool to... Um, or appropriate emotionally to be able to subtly color the lyrics and the and the melody and the vocal with that those colors and those particular instruments. Um, so and um, and then beyond that, in terms of uh, you know, I, I studied with Fernando Huergo this last semester, who plays bass on the recordings, and he's really um, an incredible expert in this music and taught me a lot about the repertoire and about the the rhythms and so forth and we would workshop the arrangements as we went. Um, so uh, uh, that's how he became involved. And everybody everybody did a fantastic job in the studio. I was really pleased with it. Wonderful. 
Yeah. Uh, congratulations. Thank yeah. you. Jason, wow. I just had a flashback of our first class at the New England Conservatory. And, yeah. Uh, to see a whole chapter of your life and, and see how you have progressed and walk towards the future, and it's pretty amazing. And um, I want to tell you, this, this work is outstanding from many, many point of view. I think um, rebuilding society to the eyes of the new generation, looking at possibilities of telling a story or getting, getting material for inspiration from situations that were really tragic and present it in a way that becomes an educational opportunity for America, United States in this sense, uh, you know, look at the history as a potential um, way to rebuild diplomatic relationships in a, in a 21st century way is unbelievable. And I think it, it will have a, a, a tremendous impact as time goes by because you are actually giving another way of looking. And Chileans are really, um, um, the, the tragedy that happened in Latin America and and the ways that you are presenting the possibilities through music is, is really therapeutic to me, mm. you know. Um, when you present it to the, um, to the educational um, tour that you want to do, I think it's gonna be well accepted in Latin America. It's necessary, actually. And uh, I think one thing that I would add is a little more um, um, background on the Nueva Canción and the importance of certain you know, like Violeta, how she was considered the mother of the Nueva Canción and what that means. Right. When you, when you do that, try to add a little more of that. Sure. Um, I, I really am proud of you, man. The music sounds amazing. The, it, it, it's relevant to the times we're living on. And um, I think you present this so magnificent and, and, and really exciting and encouraging and um, it feels hopeful to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Jason Yeager.